Well, we appreciate your being here today, and let me add my word of welcome to Harold's. We appreciate your being here, and it's our sincere prayer that no one would be able to leave this building today without experiencing the presence of God with us. Not just knowing in your mind that he's here, but experiencing with your body that he is indeed present with us, just as he promised. If you'll get your Bibles, please, and turn to Romans chapter 8, and this will be the epistle reading for this fifth Sunday in Lent. I know I usually use the gospel reading, but I had preached that text for several times in the last uh, couple of years, so I wanted to go to the epistle reading, which is Romans chapter 8, and it's 11 verses, so be patient with me as I read. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live by the flesh or in the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what, I'm sorry, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, They do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Now, God, give us your grace that we can hear, understand, believe, and do what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. (coughs) If you'll notice, chapter 8 starts with the word, therefore, which connects it to what went before. And it's hard to understand what Paul's saying now if we don't have some of what he said before. So I'm going to just give you a short synopsis of of the chapters that have gone before us. Paul first addressed uh, in Romans the condition of sin in which humanity finds itself and God's righteous judgment uh, upon sin. He then turns to God's faithfulness in providing a solution to the problem of sin. And in chapter 4, to the solution itself, which is justification by faith. That God will justify us before him by our faith alone. He says our sins are forgiven, that we're justified before God by our faith in Jesus Christ. That by putting our trust in God, what God has done for us in Jesus, we can experience forgiveness of sin and receive power to overcome sin, to live holy lives. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Today I want to just address two questions that are raised by this text, and I think we need them answered if we want to live 
the abundant life. We need to understand the meaning uh, or the answer to these two questions. <coughs> First is, <clears throat> just what is condemnation? What is condemnation? Now the Greek word is katakmaria, rima, and it refers to an adverse sentence or the verdict as you would have it, or condemnation. It's a legal term. It refers to God's verdict and sentence rendered in the case of God versus humanity in which humanity has been charged with violating the law of God. The verdict is guilty as charged and the sentence is death. Now God warned us about this from the beginning. He said you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now the guilty verdict and death sentence hangs over the head of every human being. Whether one believes there is a God or whether they believe there is not a God, they are, we are all painfully aware of the fact of human mortality and the power of death. Listen to the writer of Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The fact of human mortality then results in bondage to the fear of death. Now living in that bondage causes us to lose our sense of value and thus our sense of purpose to the point that life really has no meaning. You know, we struggle with the difficulties of living in a fallen world and then we die our body is placed in a black hole and that's it. What does life matter? Now people react to human mortality in different ways depending upon what their faith is, where they've been, how they've been raised, a whole lot of factors. Some people get pessimistic. They just give up to bitterness and depression. Some even to despair and suicide. Some decide if there's a material world is all there is to life, then I'm just going to get all of it I can. This results in rank materialism, greed, workaholism. Others say I'm dead meat anyway. What does it matter if I rob a bank and kill the banker? You know, kill the tail. It doesn't matter. You know, that's why God tried to instill in us that life is precious, that it's sacred. It's a sacred gift of God. You know, with regard to every evil and difficulty that we experience in this life, from low self-esteem all the way to murder, if you trace it back far enough, we'll find that condemnation is at least a part of the root system that produces the wrong behavior. If we want to achieve human wholeness, we must take account of sin and the condemnation that accompanies it. Now, with all this in mind, listen again to what Paul says. Therefore, there is now, after the revelation of Jesus, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that may be one of the most significant sentences ever written in history. Get this one truth embedded in your spirit. And you can be set free from a host of ills. The second question is, where does condemnation come from? Well, our sin condemns us. Our sin condemns us. Peter said, Jesus said, I don't condemn you. But if you haven't obeyed my word, it will condemn you on the last day. 
but it's God alone that declared that the wage of sin is death. Now the sense of condemnation or the feeling associated with it has the godly purpose of warning us that something is wrong and to cause us to seek God. But as Hebrews told us, the devil uses those feelings to confuse us and to hold us in bondage. Let me just give you a couple of quick stories to illustrate what I'm saying. These are true stories. A successful pastor confessed to a fellow pastor who was a friend of mine and told me this story that he had flown to Las Vegas, hired an escort and spent the night with her in a hotel and then returned home. And he felt so guilty about it, he had to confess to someone. It was just eating him up inside. Well, my friend was astounded <laughs> by the whole thing. He knew this guy well. He said, what in heaven's name in the world made you do such a stupid thing? He said, well, my wife and I started going steady in middle school. We dated all through middle school, high school, and college, and then we got married. He said, I have never kissed even held hands with another woman. I look in the mirror and I see that I'm getting old and I just had to see what it's like before it was too late. Death was encroaching on him, you see. And the devil used the fear of that encroaching age and death to push him over the edge, to give way to a temptation that he had long resisted. A young college student came to see a fellow pastor and because he was depressed, he just really felt bad about himself. So the pastor began to talk with him and discovered that this kid was up to his eyeballs in sin. I mean, he was living life wild and woolly. College is college life. And he looked at him and he said, son, you're supposed to feel this way. This is God's warning to you that you need to turn your life around. You need to get your life straightened out. Well, the kid got mad. He said, you're my pastor. You're supposed to make me feel better about myself. He said, no, no, no. That's not my job to make you feel better. My job is to point you to the truth of God. And the truth of God says you're in their eyeballs up, in sin up your eyeballs by your own admission. The only way you're going to feel better is to repent and change your lifestyle. You see, the devil confused that young man by causing him to misinterpret his feelings of condemnation. You know, that's why we need each other a lot. We need to hold each other accountable to help us resist temptation. In, in this case, this young man, uh, this young man, uh, some people may prefer to call his feelings conviction rather than condemnation. And given the common usage and understanding of the words, that may be a better choice of words, but we're discussing the technical legal meaning of the Greek word that Paul used. So it's tomato or tomato. Condemnation, conviction, they're really the same thing. No one but God has the right and the authority to condemn a human being. Are you with me? No one has the authority or right to put any condemnation on you but God himself. And he would only do that for your good, to push you to repentance. We are given authority to condemn people in the enforcement of godly laws. We are told by God these things are against the law and we can try them, convict them, and enter a condemnation suit a verdict against them and punish them, whatever the punishment is. But all other condemnation we experience as believers is false if it's not God trying to help us work through a difficult time. 
That is false condemnation. The source of all false condemnation is the devil. Revelation 12, 10, he said, 12, 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice from heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of the brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. The devil will not miss one opportunity Amen. to heap condemnation on our heads. Now he may use someone else to deliver it. It may come from one of your enemies or it may come from a parent or a friend, even ourselves. But when you hear a voice, regardless of where it comes from, that says, you're no good, you'll never amount to anything. God could never use you after what you've done. You've out God's grace. There's no hope for you now. Rest assured, that is the voice of the devil, Amen. no matter whose mouth it comes out of. Amen. Low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, and other mental and emotional disorders plague many people in our culture in our culture, whether they're Christian or not. Much of it is rooted in condemnation. They feel a sense of condemnation. Now, counseling, psychology, psychiatry, and medicine can be very helpful for people struggling in this area. But from my reading and my experience, it seems there's only one complete, long-term solution. It's experiencing God's love. From knowing that we are loved by and valued by God. Amen. Our worth is not rooted in our successes or our failures, but in God. And God says we are persons of worth, which he demonstrated by dying on the cross for us while we were still sinners. In God's plan for the redemption of humanity, he is counting on us to do something that only we can do. And if we don't do it, it won't get done. And the advancement of the kingdom of God will suffer because of it. We are important to God. And our lives have eternal value. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. God does not condemn his people. If we are Christians and we suffer under condemnation, it's because of two things, one of two things. Either we've drifted from God and we're fallen into sin, or the devil has tricked us. And we've believed a lie and thus failed to experience God's liberating love. <clears throat> if you have feelings of condemnation and you know you're sinning, turn to God, repent, believe God. If it doesn't go, go away, then it's the devil's just continuing it on and you're going to have to shake him off. Yes. Just like Paul, remember that snake attached to his hand, venomous snake, and he just shook it off in the fire. Well, that's what you got to do with the devil when you know you're right with God and he keeps heaping condemnation on you. God has given us the authority and the power to tell the devil to shut up and get out. Do you hear me? This is the very good news. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus.